Welcome back to Civil Wars. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is the second half of our discussion on the Revelation Principle. You'll remember that last lecture concluded with us thinking about how the Revelation Principle was pretty trivial, but yet if you take the contrapositive of the statement, you actually get something that's going to be really useful in us figuring out whether negotiations are doomed to result in war. So let's start off with the logic portion of this lecture. What is a contrapositive? Well, contraposition tells us that the following two statements are logically equivalent. If P, then Q is the exact same thing as saying, if not Q, then not P. And we call that second statement the contrapositive of the first statement. So if one of those things is true, then the other one is true as well. And this is important for the revelation principle, because you might recall that the revelation principle itself is an if-then statement. And so we know that the revelation principle is true, which means the contrapositive of the statement is going to be true as well. But before we get to that, let's just give some background intuition about why contraposition works and why these two things are logically equivalent in a way that doesn't require you to click on that annotation and go through some more longer lectures on the subject. So here's an example to see this in action. Think about the statement, if I am in New York, then I am in the United States. So this is an if-then statement, and this is true. New York is entirely within the United States. So if you're that black dot there inside of New York, then you must be in the United States as well. That's just how it is. You can't be in New York and not be in the United States. You have to be in the United States. Well, if we take the contrapositive of this statement, well, first of all, by what I just said, it must be true. But to see that it must be true, think about this. If I am not in the United States, then I'm not in New York. We took the if part and flip-flopped it with the, the then part. That's hard to say. The then part. And we negated both halves of the statement. And so this is saying that if you're that white dot now outside of the United States, then there's no way that you're in New York. New York is entirely within the United States. So if you're not in the United States, then you can't possibly be in New York. So this is why contraposition works this is at least an example of it. And if we take this idea of contraposition and apply it to the revelation principle, what do we get? Well, the revelation principle's contrapositive says that if no incentive compatible direct mechanism exists, then an outcome of a game is not the result of optimal play. So if players are actually behaving strategically as we think that they should, a rebel group and a government should be behaving strategically when they negotiate with each other, well, it can't be the case that the outcome of the game is what we were thinking it is if we can't write down an incentive-compatible direct mechanism. And that might not yet seem relevant, but think about this. Why is this really, really cool? Well, if we want to know whether we can guarantee the peace or not, we're left with a difficulty in figuring out whether the mechanism that we actually wrote down, the way of negotiating with each other that we wrote down was at fault, or whether it's just impossible to come up with a way to get parties to negotiate with each other that guarantees the peace. So in a more applied example, imagine that United Nations sponsored negotiations fail. Well, if that happened, was it because the United Nations messed up in the way it had the parties negotiate with each other? Or was it because the United Nations was put into a, an impossible situation and it didn't matter how the actors were negotiating with each other, they were guaranteed to be doomed to fight a war? Well, if we think that the first part is the cause, that the United Nations messed up, then the solution would be the next time we have parties negotiate, that we change the manner that they negotiate with one another. And if that fails, then we think about a new way to have them negotiate with each other. And if that fails, then we think about a new way. And we keep going on and on and on until we finally hit something that works. On the other hand, if it was the United Nations just being put into an impossible situation, then it doesn't matter how many iterations that we go through here, we're just never going to come up with something that works the way that we want it to. All right, well, it's hard to actually differentiate between those two things. So if we were to try to rewrite the structure of negotiations every single time, that's a very difficult task because, well, there are infinitely many of those ways of negotiating. And so if ultimately all of those things are going to fail, then this is sort of an exercise in futility. So how can we figure out if it's an exercise in futility or not? 
Well, that's where the revelation principle comes into play. The revelation principle says that we don't have to sort through all possible institutional structures. We don't need to think about every single way a rebel group and a government can negotiate with each other in order to figure out that it's impossible to create such a mechanism or such a way of those parties negotiating with each other for them to be guaranteed to result in a peaceful outcome. And furthermore, the revelation principle says that we don't even have to care about the strategic play in each of those institutional settings. We don't have to think about how the players are going to behave strategically in response to the negotiation incentives that we put in front of them. The revelation principle says that all we have to care about is whether an incentive-compatible direct mechanism exists. So more specifically, all we need to do is see if we can create a peaceful direct mechanism that encourages truth-telling. That's the incentive compatibility part. If no such mechanism exists, then it is impossible to guarantee the peace. That's what the revelation principle, or rather the contrapositive of the revelation principle tells us. If it's not possible to write down a peaceful direct mechanism, then there's no way, regardless of the exact incentive structure or the exact way we have them negotiate with each other, there is no way to guarantee the peace. And as we go through different cases, we're going to see whether an incentive-compatible direct mechanism exists in this way is going to depend on a couple of different things. So we could think about the source of uncertainty and the costs of war as being the four different worlds that we might be in. And what we're going to see in the next lecture is that if the source of uncertainty is about the costs of war, then it doesn't matter whether those costs are high or low there is going to be a way that we can structure negotiations to guarantee the peace. So this is the positive outcome, something that is nice to see, that we can actually show that there are ways to guarantee the peace if what I don't know is how costly you view war to be. And we're also going to see some good news when it comes to power. If there is uncertainty about who's going to win the war or what war is going to distribute and how much to each party, and the costs of war are high, then it's still possible to construct a way of negotiating with each other that guarantees the peace. So that's the good news. Unfortunately, there's going to be some bad news here, as you might imagine. If we have three smiley faces, what that what is that fourth box going to be? Well, that fourth box is going to be a no. If the source of uncertainty is about power, how much we're going to be distributing through war, and the costs of war are low, then it doesn't matter how you structure your negotiations, you are guaranteed to not be able to write down a way to assure the peace. You cannot have peace be the guaranteed outcome of those negotiations. It's always going to be the case that with some probability, war is going to occur under those circumstances. That's a pretty powerful thing to say, right? I'm talking about literally every single way we could possibly have two parties, a rebel group and a government negotiate with each other. It doesn't matter how we do it. It's still going to be the case that with some probability, war is going to occur. And it doesn't matter which of those ways of negotiating that we are actually are the ones that, that is actually the one that we're implementing. It's going to be the case that there's some probability of war. And we're going to be seeing that now in the next couple of lectures. So I hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you next time. Take care.